All right, here we are, week number four of our series called Overwhelmed. How many of you have ever been overwhelmed? How many of you this series has helped you a little bit deal with being overwhelmed? It's okay, good. I got a couple hands, not a lot of voices. So you guys are allowed to talk back to me. You know that, right? Okay, that person knows. Nobody else does. All right, fine. We'll work with that. Okay, how many of you have ever been laying in bed? This is my, this is a, this is kind of a simple overwhelm story, but it's an overwhelm story. Have you ever been laying in bed at night? It's like 2 a.m. You're asleep and you hear that chirp, that beep. And you're like, oh my gosh, what is that? Right? And, and you wait for a minute and a, and a minute goes by and you're like, okay, what? Beep. Like, what is going on? And your brain starts to swirl, right? You're, you're, you're waking up, beep, and you're like, dear Jesus, make it go away. I'm a pastor. You're supposed to do things for me. Help me out, right? Make it, and you realize, smoke detector. You ever been there? Beep. And what do you do? You can't, you can't sleep now because you know it's coming. And it's distant, it's spaced out enough so that you doze off, and then it, beep, wakes you up once again. And you get angry, don't you? Never been there? And so what do you do? You walk around and you look for the smoke detector and you wait. Beep. Nope, not that one. Next. And you climb on your kitchen counter and you're like, beep. Dang it. Seriously, where is this thing? And you walk around and aren't you getting more and more angry with every smoke detector you go to? And pretty soon your wife's out of bed and she's standing in the kitchen. She goes, no, I think it's the kitchen. And you're going, it's not the kitchen. I was just in the kitchen. And pretty soon you guys are fighting and it's three in the morning and it's all over what? A nine volt battery, man. (laughs) Stressed, overwhelmed. Why is that an overwhelming situation? Because of the timing, right? Because it's 2 a.m. Because you're tired. Because you want to do anything else except stand on your bathroom counter and listen for the beep, right? And then what do you do? Well, anyway, getting a battery in a smoke detector tied to the ceiling is a ridiculous thought, isn't it? Like up like this in the middle of the night, whatever. But it's, the reason why it's so overwhelming is because of the timing. How many of you have ever been overwhelmed by something in your life that the timing was just bad? Maybe it was an employment thing. Maybe it was a marriage thing. Maybe it was a kid thing. Maybe it was a health thing. And the timing was just very, very poor. And you go, oh my gosh, I am overwhelmed. Not that the situation is all that overwhelming, but right now it is. It's another wave. It's just adding on top. And, and sometimes that happens in our life, doesn't it? Where we get overwhelmed just because something comes in. Now this week we're going to talk about the, the, the dichotomy between a good God and a world that kind of seems evil. And and, and we get encountered with this every time something stressful comes our way that's kind of out of the blue, that that unexpected moment, the the timing was wrong. And and we think, well, God, how could you let this happen to me? If you're so good, like they say at church on Sunday and the Bible says, but this world, I see the evidence of the world being not so good. So how can a good God and a bad world coexist? And you come to one or two conclusions that either God is not good or God does not exist. If you follow that chain, chain of logic. Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper, and we're going to try and discover, in a world that seems so bad, how can people believe that God is good? Because I've seen people walk through some of the most difficult circumstances in their life and come out on the other side of it and go, you know what, God is still good. People who have lost loved ones, spouses, parents, lost children, and on the other side they go, I don't understand everything, but God is still good. How do they do that? How do they reconcile the thought of a good God in a bad world? Well, today, to open up this subject, I've got a six-minute video clip for you from the, the spiritual mentor named Colbert. Have you ever heard of him? It's a joke. If you've never heard of him, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, it's, it, the Colbert Report is a show on Comedy Central. So here's my disclaimer. The Colbert Report is a show on Comedy Central, okay? So it, it's meant to be a comedy. It's meant to be funny. So if you take everything he says literally, you will either be confused or offended. And I don't want you to be confused or offended. It's a comedy. But what I really want you to focus in on is the last section of this video. There's one illustration he gives at the end, and that's going to be our starting point. All right? So without any further ado, let's check out the Colbert Report. (laughs) I love it. What if Jesus is an elephant? You ever thought of that before? Like what if, what if, what if the, the slice of time or the, the perspective that we have right now is so small that we couldn't accurately judge what's going on in the world all around us? You ever been there? What, what if we can't see it all? And I think you would be first to admit, just like me, 
Oh, I know I can't see it all. I, I've had plenty of things not being able to see. I, I've had plenty of things catch me by surprise. What, what if Jesus is kind of bigger than our understanding? What if God and, and what he's doing is bigger than us? So, so what I want to do today is I want to help us kind of push back from the elephant a little bit and go, oh, tip to tail, there's something a little bigger going on here, right? And not that I'm saying that we're going to be able to understand all things that God is doing, far from it. In fact, if we could understand all things that God is doing, he would no longer be God and we would. And oftentimes we put ourselves in that position because we say, God, I don't like what you're doing. I don't understand it. So therefore, I'm going to act as God and I'm going to pass judgment and I'm going to say this is good and that's evil. All right, that one was for free. Okay, now check this out. We're going to push back from the elephant. We're going to take a big look at the big picture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. First page in your Bible. Not in your notes. I'm just going to give you a summarization, okay? Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And over the course of six days, God made all things. And he said that all these things were good. And then he made humanity as well. And he said, it is, they are very good. Page 1. God created this spirit or this physical perfection. There was no health concerns. There was no relationship concerns. There was no concerns whatsoever. There was utopia. You know what I'm talking about? There is peace on earth. Have you ever thought about peace on earth before? Have you ever prayed for peace in certain, certain situations? God created the earth peaceful. He created it right there, ready to go. Peace on earth. Page two. Turn your Bible. One more page. Page 2 says that God wanted to be with man, wanted to have a relationship with humanity. So he would walk with them. He would talk with them. He would eat with them. He would do whatever. He would just, he would go over. He would, did life with the people, with humanity. And that's what we would call spiritual perfection. There is nothing between God and humanity at this point. They can have open dialogue, open conversation with God. And they can hear his voice very clearly. Turn the page, page 3. So we've got... Uh, physical perfection or peace on earth. Then we've got uh, spiritual perfection, which is uh, peace with God. Then page three says this. The world became a jacked up place. Everything got screwed up from then on. And we live in it now. Here's what happened. Man was given earth. He said, this perfect, peaceful earth, God says to man, this is yours. Rule it. Work it. Manage it. Do what you need to do in this earth. And then man goes, okay, I've got this. And God gave him the ability to choose on how to do this. And we sin. And from that point on, physical perfection was lost and spiritual perfection was lost. Because now there is a gap between humanity and God. Follow me on my logic here? There's this, there's this was perfection, but then man took a right turn and left perfection. And now this world is a sinful, jacked up, fallen place. And you don't need me to convince you of that because you've seen the evidence yourself, right? And so the question is, if God is good and the world is bad, why didn't God do something about it? Been there? Nobody else, just me. Cool, all right. Well, I'm glad you asked, everybody. Glad I asked myself. So we've got God who is good in the world that's bad. Why didn't God bring them back together? Well, the answer is he did. You see, spiritual perfection, peace with God, is attainable today because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Think about it like this. You and I were born into the slavery of sin. Jesus says, whoever sins is a slave to sin. So we are in custody of sin. We are in prison. Did you know in New York, a woman who is sentenced to prison, in, she's incarcerated, if she's pregnant, she can have a baby in jail, and up to 18 months, that baby can live with her in her cell. Can you imagine being a guard walking by every day, first words, first steps, first solid food, First, up to 18 months, this child is living in a cell the size of the carpet up here on the stage. That's kind of a graphic illustration, but that's the way we find ourselves, having done nothing wrong, but being born into the environment of sin. And we find ourselves in this environment of sin, like that baby, not knowing what prison is. We're just here. We, just, we don't even realize that we're slaves to sin or we're slaves to the debt of sin, yet here we are. If we didn't do anything wrong, we just were born into it and we got that nature of sin and therefore we sin, correct? How many of you have kids? Did you have to teach them to sin? No, they were born into this crap, right? This is what happens. They were born into the nature of sin and all of us were born that way. And it's like that baby being born into prison. No, we don't know anything different. 
We think bars are there, supposed to be there. We're supposed to have concrete floors. We're supposed to have somebody guarding us all the time. That's the mentality that we're born into. And God goes, okay, I'm going to make a difference. There's going to be spiritual perfection between humanity and me. There's going to be a way for them to live at peace with me. And Jesus says, I have come to set you free. Does it make sense now that he says, I've come to set you free? Because we're going, I didn't know I was captive. I, I'm a good person. You are a good person. But you're still a slave to sin. We're still born into this world, this gap. And he says, Jesus has come for you to bridge the gap so that we could become, to have that perfect peace with God, spiritual perfection. He says, that's why I came. That's why Christ came for us. So we have this world that is evil, and we have this God that is good, and we have Jesus as the gap stop to, to bridge that gap between it. Now, physical perfection, we're not going to get that till we get to eternity. Just going to tell you that right now. We're not going to look perfect. We're not going to have the perfect figure, all right? We're not going to, we're not going to do it. We're health, all that stuff, that is, that is temporal things. Health, wealth, those types of things, relational things. Those are kind of temporary, earthly things. But God says, I know the thing that lasts forever in you. That's the spiritual side of you. And I'm going to create a way for you to live at peace with me for eternity in that realm. Good news, right? Yeah. All right, good. So here's the next question that, that I ask, and apparently you guys don't ask the same questions as me because I've already asked you, and you're like, cricket, cricket, right? So here's my next question. Who do I blame when things go wrong? Right? Whose fault is it? Who, 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 where can I give the credit to? So if you guys want to write down a couple things, I've got three things for you, and then my third thing has a couple things, okay? So give credit where credit is due. There's good in the world, there's evil in the world, there's ugly in the world, and there's all kinds of other things. So I've got three sources for you to give credit. Number one, give credit where credit is due. Give credit to Satan. TJ, are you sure? I don't even know if Satan exists. Well, Jesus believed it, and I believe in Jesus, so... Ta-da. Well, TJ, I don't even know if I believe in Adam and Eve. Well, Jesus believed in it. He died, rose again, and came back and died for my sins. I'll believe whatever that man believes. You know what I'm talking about? He did it for me, so I'm going to believe what he believed. And so Jesus gives us this, this verse in John chapter 10, verse 10. It's, there's two parts, so I'm going to read the first part of it. John 10, 10, part A says this. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. If you've experienced something being stolen from you, something being killed in your life, maybe it's your dream, maybe it's your joy, or something has been destroyed inside of you, that could be the work of the enemy. TJ, I don't know if I believe that. And then there's others that are like, oh yeah, the devil's around every corner, you've got to watch out. There's skepticism and then there's superstition and they're two extremes. And I'm going, don't live on either extreme, but live in the middle. Know that there's an adversary, but know that God is greater, Amen. This is what it says, 1 Peter 5, 8. Stay alert. Say, don't, don't go to sleep on this one. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. Who is that? The devil, all right? He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I don't believe that the devil exists. Hum, 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 right? Oh, I'm living in fear because this devil is so powerful. Hum, hum, he, it's gone, right? But if we live with the belief in the authority of Christ, that he says, you know what? God is greater I can live with peace. And I can give credit where credit is due, right? So next one, second place we give credit where credit is due, God. So John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God's purpose, this is Jesus talking, my purpose is to give them a rich, we can pull that up on the screens, John 10.10 10, part B. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So you see the, the two sides of this, right? Good versus evil. Only good is a lot better, a lot bigger, a lot stronger. And he says, my purpose is to give you life, rich, honest, satisfying life. Can this world be evil? Yes, but I can give you new life in the midst of all of this. And so James 1.17 says this, check it out. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. Whatever is good, whatever is perfect. That blessing that you received, guess who it's from? God. Well, I worked really hard for that. Who gave you the ability to work hard for that? God. Or, well, I just got lucky. Who gave you breath so that you're alive to get lucky, right? Like, God. God gives us 
all the good things. Who created all the lights in the heavens? He's all powerful and never changes and cast in, or casts a shifting shadow. The same God that created the physical perfection from day one with the garden and all, that spoke all things into existence is still giving good gifts to you and I today. That's good news, right? So, so sometimes we go through bad things. Bad times we're going, well, God, why am I going through this bad thing? If you're supposed to give good gifts, what, what's going on? Well, sometimes God allows you to go through something so that he can be glorified so it can become a good gift in your life. Jesus is walking down the road. His disciples see a man born blind and they go, Jesus, did this man sin or was it his parents? Because he was born blind, so it couldn't be his sin, really. So it must have been his parents. But why would he have to pay for his parents' sin, right? Like what, so what, what was, what's going on here? And Jesus goes, oh, neither one. It wasn't him, one of his parents. This man was born blind so that God could be glorified. And he walks over and he heals the man and the man's eyes are open. His entire life was lived with blindness just for the moment that God could be glorified. Don't discount the fact that what you're going through right now could be a moment later on in your life for God to go, boom, I'm going to use you for my work. Another reason uh, that, that God kind of allows us to go through things before he gives us the good, we have to go through the bad to get to the good sometimes, is because there's something in our character that God needs to develop inside of us. You remember a couple weeks ago, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did nothing wrong, yet they got thrown into the furnace, Right? And God didn't get them out. He got them through. And as a result, their faith was stronger than ever. As a result, they got to see Jesus in the flames with them. As a result, their hearts grew and they were promoted as a result. Sometimes we walk through hard times, through overwhelming circumstances, so that God can build our character in us. Do you like it? Probably not. I would not like getting thrown into the fiery furnace. I don't want that to happen to me. But if God has a plan in all of it, and he's going to get me through it instead of getting me out of it, I'll just trust him, and I'm going to walk with him. Good stuff, right? Let's walk with Christ. And then third, third, thing, third place we blame, and this is the source of most of my pain, is myself. You ever been there? You ever been there where just like there's so many things going on in your life, and, and you're in overwhelming circumstance, and you look back and you can pinpoint the decision you made? right, that got you there. <laughs> most of the pain, most of the trial in my life came from my own stupidity. Dave Ramsey, it was the, the, we're, his course that we're teaching here at Finest Beast University, he's also a best-selling author, national radio talk show host. He says, it's the stupid tax. <laughs> you do something stupid, you pay the stupid tax. And that's what happens in my life sometimes. Sometimes, uh, you, you ever been with a group of buddies when you were younger and you're just like, hey guys, watch this, woo, <laughs> stitches, hospital visit, ER, something like that. You were being stupid, so you paid the stupid tax, right? Or have you ever been driving down the road and the blue lights are in your mirror behind you? Oh, the devil's out to get me today. No, you were just speeding, all right? <laughs> it, the, the police officer behind you is not in a work of the devil. He's not in work for the devil. He works for the government, which for some of you, might be close. I'm just saying, if, you, it's ta if we just got out of tax season, so you may see the government as the devil, whatever. But, but that guy is not an agent, at least none of the police officers that I know. He's not an agent of the devil. He's just, spe you're speeding, so you got a ticket, right? And it's not always that simple. Sometimes it's our lust that draws us in and we pay the stupid tax on it. Sometimes it's our greed. Sometimes it's our selfishness. Sometimes it's our pride that leads us away and begins to grow inside of us and we go, oh, that hurts. But it was our decision. You want to give credit where credit is due? Steal, kill, and destroy, you know where it goes. Good gifts, you know where that goes. And then Galatians chapter 6, verse 8 says this about us. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. See, we're born into this slavery of sin. Christ has set us free. Yet there's always the temptation to go back to the sin, right? Because of things like greed and pride and selfishness and lust and anger, whatever, whatever it is that draws you away. If we let that seed grow in us, we will harvest decay and death. But, good thing there's a but, right? Like, but those who live to please the Spirit, that's God's Spirit dwelling within us, will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. That seed of God's spirit that's planted into us, if we allow that to grow, 
we're going to harvest life. So our choice is decay and death or life. I don't know about you. I know which one I want. But we have to allow one of them to grow. And so think about it like this. There's, there, look, think about two voices. All right? There's the voice of the sinful nature. There's the voice of pride. There's the voice of lust. There's the voice of selfishness and greed and all these other things. There's a voice that will call to you, hey, do this. Oh, you deserve better than that. You, 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 you need revenge on that person. You need to do this. And, there's always, and then there's the voice of the Spirit. The voice of the Spirit calling, saying, no, 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 you don't want to do that. Walk this way. This is going to bring you more joy. This is going to bring you more peace. This is the way out of that depression. This is the way out of that overwhelming circumstance. And we can choose to listen. But the problem is, the voices sound the same in the beginning. So how do you fight back? How do you, how do you discern the difference? So uh, how, how to fight back? Check this out right up here on the screens. Know God's voice. How? by studying his word and spending time in prayer. It's as simple as that. Know God's voice by reading his word and spending time in prayer. If you don't know his voice, you will listen to any voice, won't you? But you need to know his voice, which means you need to develop a relationship with him. When I first started dating my wife, who, well, she wasn't my wife then, she was just my girlfriend, right? I started dating her. She had a sister and a mom at home, and I would call, and I would go, and they would answer the phone, and they'd say, hello. And since we were just dating, we just started. I didn't know the difference between her voice, her sister's voice, and her mom's voice on the phone, right? And so I'd just be like, they go, hello, and I go, this is TJ. And they would, they would kind of diagnose what needs to happen next. They go, oh, I'll go get Leah for you. I was like, okay, that was not Leah, all right? And then, and then they, and, or it was like, oh, hey, babe. I'm like, that's my girl right there, right? Like you're talking about? And, and I, because I didn't know her voice. Now, now I call her and she answers the phone. Not only do I know it's her voice, I can tell how she's feeling, right? I can tell if she's had a good day, a bad day, if the kids are kind of driving her nuts, if she's having a ho-hum day. You know what? I can tell all from her voice. The same is true with our relationship with God. We will know his voice when we have a long-term relationship with him. This is how Jesus puts it in John chapter 10. We just read the verses, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they have a rich, full, satisfying life. This is before that. So you already know that the shepherd is good, and you know that the thief is bad. I tell you the truth. This is Jesus talking. I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold, rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. So you get the picture, right? There's a giant, penned-in, fenced-in area, and there's one gate, and the thief, that one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, hops the fence to get the sheep. And he says, but the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. So there's, 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 there's two people, one that jumps in and one that goes in the gate. The right one is going through the gate, and the thief is coming to steal, kill, and destroy, is jumping the fence. Now, in this illustration, Jesus is the shepherd. The enemy is, the devil is the thief, and you and I are the sheep. Follow me? I don't want to be a sheep. Jesus told the story, so just get over it, all right? So we're the sheep. And listen to this. It, it goes on. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, the, the shepherd. He opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Let me pause there for a second. He calls them by name, and they recognize his voice. And then what does he do? He leads them out. He leads them out of their circumstance. Psalm 23, you lead me beside the quiet waters, right? You, to, to the green fields where, where I'm a sheep. I'm supposed to go to this water and grass. It's what I need, right? The shepherd leads me out to the, to the good in my life. And Jesus is looking at all the people around him as he tells this parable, as he tells this story, and he goes, the shepherd wants to lead you out of your circumstance, out of your overwhelming circumstance, but you must know his voice. And it continues. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They, don't, they won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. All the time in our life, there are const we're being constantly bombarded by thoughts and voices that want to pull us in different directions. Now, I'm not talking like mental kind of voices. I'm talking on the spiritual side, where we talk to God and we hear back from God. And many times, for most of us, it's kind of hard to discern what the voice of God is like and what every other voice is like. But over the course of time, as you dive into his word and you begin to spend time in prayer with him, his voice becomes abundantly clear and you can discern right away, this is the way I'm supposed to go because God is leading me out. Why? Because I know his voice. And every other voice, 
I can run away from that. I don't need to listen to that. I can, as the Bible says, take captive every thought and make it subservient or make it serve Jesus Christ. And so right now, how are you doing hearing God's voice in your life? If the answer is like, eh, so-so, or I'm terrible at it, or if I'm just okay at it, here's your homework. Pray. I don't know how to pray. Well, you have a conversation with someone once, right? Do the same thing with God. Talk, and then listen. And then talk, and then listen. That's what prayer is. If it helps you, put two chairs out. Sit in one and be like, God, this is your seat. Have a seat. Let's have a conversation, right? It's as simple as that. Okay. Well, how do I know it's God's voice speaking to me? In the beginning, you don't. Because you don't know his voice. But over the course of time, you will. Open up his word. Begin to read what the word of God says to us. TJ, I don't really like reading. I don't care if you like reading. Do you want to know his voice? Well, TJ, I'm not very good at it. I read slow. It's not a contest, right? <laughs> well, TJ, I don't understand everything. It's because you don't know his voice. If you read, you will learn his voice. You follow me on that? And following his voice uh, and knowing his voice will be so important for your growth because then you will know that God is good in a world that seems so bad because you have him guiding you. You have him directing you. You have him leading you. And he is the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 10 again. Thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. Uh, my purpose is that you may have life. Verse 11 says this, I am the good shepherd. Shepherd. He's going, just in case you were wondering, I'm the good shepherd. The one that's leading you out, that's me. And the good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. You see, we were born into the environment in the prison of sin, slavery of sin, right? Yet Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and I'm going to lay down my life for you so that you can live in spiritual perfection, so that you can have peace with God. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm going to lay my life down for you. And so let's take a moment right now. Nobody else kind of looking around. Nobody else uh, moving, really. What I'd like to do is I'd just like to speak to you from my heart for a moment. There was a time in my life where I did not know God. In fact, I was, I was far away from God. I was a slave to sin. I didn't even know it. I was born into this world, and I thought this is just how life is. But then one day, I met the good shepherd. And I found out that this good shepherd laid down his life for me so that I could live at peace with God. And that he would set me free from the slavery of a world that seems so evil. I didn't have to be subject to that anymore. And I'd love it this morning if you would be free with me too. If you've never made, said a, a prayer that says, Jesus set me free, I give my entire life to you. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash all that junk away. This morning, I'd love it if you prayed that prayer with me. So if you could, close your eyes, bow your heads. Here's what I'm going to do. Nothing weird's going to happen, but I'm just going to pray a prayer. And I'm going I'm to pray it as if I'm praying it. And if the words resonate in your heart, your mind, in your life, what God is doing in you, you, you even feel like a pulling on your heart right now. Go ahead, say this prayer in your heart. And this is the one prayer that God says, I'll say yes every time. My son came, died for you, and you will receive forgiveness every time. So Jesus, right now, I open up my heart to you. And everything I do, I want to do it for your glory, God. So right now, set me free from the prison of this world, from the slavery of sin. And God, I pray that you would make me a new creation so that I could live at peace with you. So that my eyes would be open to you and all that you've done for me. Let me hear your voice. And as I move forward, I pray that over the course of time, as I grow in relationship with you, God, that I would clearly hear your voice, that you would lead me out, that you would lead me through these circumstances, these overwhelming circumstances that at times seem to be too much, but I'm just going to keep following your voice. I'm not going to give up. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody says, amen. amen.